record of it, you hold there your finger in Philippians 2 and go to the book of Acts chapter 16. Because I think this is one of the best church starting stories in all the Bible. I've always, always loved it. Okay. Acts 16 verse 9. And, and he just said that Paul had tried to go to Asia. Paul had tried to go other places. And every time the Holy Spirit told him, no, 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 don't go there, don't go there. Now Paul didn't just stop and retire. I mean, he kept trying to preach the gospel because that was his mandate. And, and he had been turned down in a place called Phrygia and Galatia and in Mysia and Bithynia. The Spirit would not allow him to go. And uh, spiritual Christians understand that, okay? But then, verse 9, a vision appeared to Paul in the night. And there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. Now, a lot of people don't realize that that verse right there changed the whole course of history and directly affected everyone in this room. Because up until then, Christianity was an Oriental Eastern religion, um, an offshoot of Judaism. But at verse 9 is where it came into Europe and affected every one of us. Now you look at Europe now, it's pathetic, okay? Because it's, it's ruined on so many levels, not just the immigration problem. Morally, it's ruined. Spiritually, it's ruined. It's a mess. But the reason why it, it was such a wonderful place so long, and such an influential place, and such a powerful place in the world scene, I mean, Europe, and its offshoots, which is us, is because of Acts 69. The gospel came, and it was received very, very widely for a long time. So Acts 69 is a pivotal verse. I mean, that's where, that's where everything changed for all of us. You know what we were doing before then? A bunch of barbarians eating each other. Okay. You couldn't find, you know, you can find the darkest place in Africa, and it wasn't as dark as Europe was at one time. Ignorant savages. But the gospel came in power and elevated. Now Europe is living out the parable of Jesus about the house that's been swept clean and garnished, but that remained empty. And now seven worst spirits have entered in over the last hundred years or so. And the last state of Europe will be worse than its first. But for a while there, <laughs> all the pagan gods were subdued. And you could argue about the level of Christianity, but that was where Christianity was and where it was propagated. And that is all just the pregnant meaning of Acts 16.9. After he saw the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel to them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, which is in Turkey, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis. And from there... Philippi, which is the chief city of the part of Macedonia, and a colony, that means it was, a, it was a Roman colony, and we were in that city abiding certain days. And on the Sabbath day we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spoke to the women which resorted there. Now what that means is that um, in Paul's method was to go to every city and find the synagogue, but there wasn't even ten Jewish males in that city. So the next best thing is he knew of a prayer meeting down by the river, basically of women. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of pearl, of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God. So she was a Jewish, uh, what you'd either call a, a Jewess or a God-fearing Gentile. She worshipped the true God. Heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of by Paul. But when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If you've judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she 
constrained us. And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Now verse 17, it's true. They are the servants of the Most High God, and they show us the way of salvation. It's true. But something about it bothered the apostle. Something grieved him every time she spoke. It was true, but there's something about it he didn't like. This she did many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, he was given a gift of the Spirit, discerning of spirits. And he spoke right to the evil spirit that was possessing that girl. Now, why would an evil spirit want to commend Paul and, uh, and, and uh, Silas? Or, uh, why would they do that? Why would he want to do that? Well, because that's a powerful way to detract from the gospel when false religion promotes it. Okay. It's not just what's said, it's who's saying it and what he represents. Now, he said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he, the evil spirit, came out the same hour. Immediately she was set free, within an hour. When her masters saw that the hope of their gain was gone... They caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers. When they cast the evil spirit out of that girl, she lost her gift, which was divination, soothsaying. She was an oracle. She was possessed by an evil spirit that would speak to her. This is very common in the ancient world. They were making money off her demon possession. <laughs> That's what a lot of people in Hollywood are doing with people like Katy Perry and them. They're, they're possessed. I think of this crazy country singer named Billy Ray Cyrus who pretends to be Christian but he allowed his daughter to go out there half naked and has exploited his own daughter to be one of the most pornographic artists out there the, the, the Bible is timeless well what did they do well Paul did a good deed didn't he but in the, this fall of the world no good deed goes unpunished as they say <laughs> So they brought them to the rulers and brought them to the magistrates saying, These men being Jews are exceedingly troubling our city. Notice how they don't bring the actual thing that happened. They bring up a politically calculated charge. They're troubling the city. By the way, in the Roman world, that was a huge thing. You, you, they like peace. They don't care what you believe as long as everything's peaceful. To trouble the city is to be in big trouble. They troubled the city. And teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together with them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Now, see, here's how it worked. The, the, the prisoner was a privatized industry. The, the prison was run by a person who made his money that way. And it wouldn't matter what he did with these people as long as he produced them the next day for court. Okay, habeas corpus, all right? So he could have put them on, their, on his couch. I mean, they're not out there killing anyone. He could have put them in, in his living room. He could have put them out in his barn. No, he takes them all the way to the pit of the prison. See, in an ancient world, you had this deep, 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 deep pit where you put the most dangerous prisoners. And he didn't just put them in the pit. He put them in stocks. You know how uncomfortable that'd be? To have your hands and feet chained to a board and then... You know, you're in this dark pit and there's rats crawling all over you and you can't even get up and go to the bathroom. You just got to go right where you're at. And they're down there in the basement in the stock. Now, can you imagine what would go through someone's mind? Maybe a modern person. Hey, God gave me a vision. Why, did, why isn't this working out? It's supposed to work out. 
I thought I was going to get a really big church. All I got is a prayer meeting by the river with a bunch of women. I thought I was going to, everything's going to really take off once I did a miracle, cast out a demon. Nope, no good deed goes unpunished. They're down there in the dank stench of their own waste. Rats scurrying all over them. But look at the next verse. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. Can you imagine that? One thing I do learn about this story, and it's a very simple lesson. Praise the Lord. Wherever you go and whatever you do, praise the Lord. There used to be a song Russ Taft sang, Praise the Lord, when you're up against a struggle that shatters all your dreams, when your hope is cruelly crushed by Satan's manifested schemes, when you feel the urge within you to submit to earthly fears, don't let the faith you're standing in seem to disappear, but praise the Lord. We're supposed to praise the Lord everywhere we go. And if there's, not, if there's an example of that, it's right here. And, and, and I was talking to a guy at the gym the other day. He said, how was your previous year? He said, I found out, and he's a very healthy guy, okay? Not like me. I mean, he is a real specimen. But he found out he had defibrillation. And he, uh, and he went to try to get shocked to fix it, and five times it didn't fix it. And then one of the times they didn't shut his mouth, so he bit through right through his tongue. <laughs> this is up at Mayo Clinic. People that just trust doctors. I mean, you got to go in prayer. So anyway, he get it's so bad because his tongue starts. Part of his tongue is a flap, and it starts dying. He took his scissors and cut it off. I said, "What did you and your wife do?" He said, "We praised the Lord." <laughs> We just praised the Lord. (laughs) He said, my tongue grew back. (laughs) And Well, I guess the tongue is the most uh, resilient of all your body parts. Well, I I can attest to that. I know how powerful the tongue can be. All right. But he said, look, we just praised the Lord. And we're praising the Lord now. And now that the year is coming to an end, we're going to praise the Lord again. Because it's been a great year. We get to wake up every morning saved. And we just don't have a free country. And we live in the best place on earth. I'm telling you, some people know how to live. Amen. Praise the Lord. The other prisoners hear these guys in the basement. And their backs are all torn up and everything. And I think it's significant, he says, 25 at midnight. Now, for some people, it is midnight, and for the world, it's coming into midnight. But they could hear him singing praises. By the way, I can't emphasize enough how valuable the worship and the discipline of worship is to us. Because I don't know about you, but to me, in the darkest times, these songs, a snatch of a song will come to me, and it will remind me, A a strain, a little breath of wind from heaven will remind me that there's so much that we have going for us. And one of the consequences of praising the the Lord, verse 26, suddenly there's a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. Okay, now there's a lesson in this too. When you praise the Lord, not only do you get free, but other people around you get free. (laughs) The doors open. How free? These guys were so free that they didn't scamper out of the cell. Now that's free. Okay, that's real freedom. When you don't even have to get out of the circumstance. When you can just be all right, right where you're at. When you can just praise God, even in the basement of a stinking prison, and when the door opens, you don't run like a mouse out of it. You say, stay right there. And what happened? The keeper of the prison, waking out of his sleep, seeing the prison doors open. Look, if he doesn't produce those prisoners, he's dead. That's Roman law. You bring him to court. If they're not here, you're the one. So he's terrified. He saw the doors open and then drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Don't do any harm to yourself. We're all here. (laughs) Can you imagine the shock of that? Verse 29. Then he called for a light. Oh, may people call for a light, right? 
and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, by the way, he's not asking, how do I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior? <laughs> he's, he's asking, uh, I'm in big trouble. Prison just opened. Who knows how many got away? <laughs> how can I be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and your house. And verse 32, they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. Cannot you see this in the house of the former prison keeper as he, as he cleans their wounds? They tell him the gospel. They share the whole thing. Two men with scars on their back chafed ankles and wrists probably had to be washed to get all the crud off them but the whole time he's putting that sponge on their back they're saying well Jesus Christ came into the world to save us by the way if you read Acts you have to ask yourself Paul why did you get a beating because in the context of Roman law you have the right to not be beaten. And you've used it before. You insisted on it many times and put the fear of God in your people that were going to beat you. Because you are a Roman citizen freeborn. You could not beat a Roman citizen without a trial. Why didn't you do it? Well, here's one reason. Yeah, I could have done that, but the guy I was with didn't have that advantage. Now wrap your mind around this. So you take a beating with a brother rather than pull out your trump card and get out of it and let him go through it? You understand what practical love that is? You'll do it with him? Yeah, the story goes on, you know, that the next day the Romans said, all right, you guys can leave. Paul said, I'm not leaving. What? Nope, you're going to have to come in here and escort me out. I'm a Roman citizen. As soon as they found out that, their knees were the ones knocking. He had the right to not be beaten. But because his brother didn't, he went through it with him. That's how the Philippian church was born. That was the birth the original people of the Philippian church was a jailer, his household, and any other people that might have been in the prison that could, couldn't fathom what had just happened. Now, let's go back to Philippians 2, because he's talking to them years later. If there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies. Now let me explain this. What's he saying? It's rhetorical. He's saying, if Christ has had any effect on your life. Well, if you really love Christ, I, mean, I know people that have been Christian for years. If you really know Jesus, if you really know Christ, if he's really in your life, then he's basically describing what should be a given. That you take your comfort in Christ, not the world. Your consolations come from him. And that you uh, have been touched by the love of God. And that... You truly are in communion with the Holy Spirit, and therefore, consequently, with everyone else, you truly have a deep sense of sympathy and compassion, especially with your brothers and sisters. Okay, that's what he's saying. If there's any of that in your life, then fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being one of, of one accord and one mind. That's God's will for the church. That we, be, that we love each other. Now, that sounds obvious, doesn't it? But in this day and age, I mean, it needs to be repeated. The lo God wants us to be in one mind. That doesn't mean that you can't have your own thoughts, but that means that we have a submissive relationship with each other. It's not my way or the highway that we are one mind, and he says 
that you uh, are one accord. And then he says it negatively, don't let anything be done through strife. Whatever you do, don't do anything through strife. And what he's teaching there is it's possible to do a good thing with a bad motive. Well, we're going to show them that we're the ones that are right. We'll do this and that and the other. Don't let anything be done through strife. We don't have anything to prove to anybody. We are not in competition with anybody. We'll only do what, whatever is not of faith is sin. Only do what God wants you to do. Don't, we don't have anything to prove. Let nothing be done through strife or through vainglory. I'm going to do this and then I'm going to look good. Vainglory is pride and it's the, the fountainhead of all sin. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Now this, is, this takes the power of God. This takes the consolation of Christ. To esteem other people better than yourself. And I, I, this is no fake humility. This is true. Now look, if you understand something, if you have understanding, okay, then you can begin to do this, all right? You can literally begin to do this if you have this understanding. That uh, if God, you know, I don't know anybody on the level I know myself. And by the way, I don't really know myself that well either. I'm always surprising myself, okay? But I do know this about myself. And I'm not telling, I'm not, this is not fake humility. I am the worst sinner I know. I just can't truly, honestly think I'm better than anyone else. Okay? I just can't. Not, I can't look at them and judge them and say, wow, if I was in that position, I'd never do that. I surprised myself. Nobody is ever very far away from defection. I truly marvel that God would have me in his family. I'm not joking. I mean, once you get that kind of understanding of the enormity of sin and the truth fall, what it really does and what it's all about, then you can, you can esteem someone better than themselves. You can look at people differently, totally differently, that their, their interests, you know, and, and, their, and, their, and their particular situation is unique. No two people are the same. But we don't always have to exalt self. In fact, we shouldn't exalt self. We do not. We should deny self. In other words, we should say no to self and its claims of superiority. Now, he goes on to say here, okay, and keep in mind how this church was founded because it's connected to this passage, okay. Look not every man on his own things. Okay, verse 4. Okay, what I'm concerned with is what I'm going through. And no two people are going through the same thing. What I'm concerned with is what I'm going through. What I'm concerned with is my troubles, my problems, my advantages, my goods, my bads, whatever. And that's natural. Okay. But if that's all it is, then that calls into question whether you really have the consolation of Christ. Because what Christ does is he makes us think about other people. Remember Paul foregoing an exemption from a beating with rods. Can you imagine how that would hurt? I haven't been beaten with a stick since my father. I got enough. I got the cure from him. <laughs> I can't imagine being beaten with rods. Paul could have got out of it. But why would you put your brother through that and not you go through it? So Paul just kept his mouth shut. He could have said one sentence that would have stopped everything for him. I am a Roman citizen. And by the way, when they did find out he was a Roman citizen, it's kind of funny when you read Acts chapter 16. They send a delegation into his cell to beg him just to leave. He didn't scamper out of prison. They escorted him out because they were afraid he was going to bring charges against him, and that would have forfeited them. So why didn't you use it, Paul? Oh, because my brother didn't have it. I could have pulled the card, but I kept it in my vest. 
esteem others better than yourself. And then it says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Well, wait a minute. Especially if you have a conflict with this person, what do they want? What, what's hurting them? Maybe I should think outside the box. How do they see it? Does it always have to be the way I see it? How do they see it? I'm not proclaiming that I've done this right or I've done this perfectly. This is just what this text teaches us. That, there's a, that, that he wants us to think outside the box and to put others ahead of ourselves. And he predicates it on if you really, knew, if you really are comforted by Christ, if you really have Christ in your, in your bowels, which is the deepest part of your being. They'd say the bowels, we'd say the heart. Okay. Then, then this is the way to act it out. This is the way to live it, all right? And then, and then he quotes to them something they're very familiar with, which is one of the earliest Christian hymns. And we are familiar with it too, because it's been one of the themes of my, my whole life. And the Spirit has just brought it time and again to this church. And even in the prayers and everything leading up to this, uh, all this stuff has been brought out, so the Holy Spirit is in this. Verse uh, 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Okay, let this mind, let this attitude be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. But, but, but let me stop here, too. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. In other words, this is the attitude of Jesus Christ. But also you can look at that like you are also in Christ Jesus. Okay, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. But what is the attitude? Verse 6, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now let me take this point by point by point. The attitude of Jesus Christ is this. He was in the form of God. He, it's not the image of God we're talking about now. It's something stronger. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Now if you think about the big picture of the Bible, that's the problem. That man who is not God, time and again, reaches out to grasp Godhood. That's the original sin. You shall be as gods. Someone says sarcastically, who do you think you are, God? And that's kind of a deep, sarcastic question. Who do you think you are, God? Well, that's a good question. Do I think I'm God? What does it mean to be as God in Satan's temptation, it means you do whatever you want and you judge yourself what good and evil are. And you decide for yourself what's good for you. And like the ad campaign says, take it, grab it, okay. And in the ancient hymn, it says, Christ Jesus, who really, really is God. Okay. It's like the opposite. Adam's not God, but he wanted to be a God, and he wanted to reach out and grab it. Who for? For himself. But Jesus is God. He's equal to God in every respect. He has a pre-existence. You cannot say of me, I came into this world. You know, we sing about Emmanuel. You came into this world. You cannot say that of any of us. We did not come into this world as if we had a pre-existence. We were born at some point in time. That was our beginning according to the ordination of God, but it certainly didn't come. Okay. But Jesus is the only one of whom you could say, he came into this world. By the way, I'll get on a sidetrack here, if you don't mind. People tell me I don't preach long enough, so I'm trying to remedy that, all right? <laughs> like, why do people hate uh, Christmas? 
What is it about the incarnation that people ought to hate it? <laughs> it's like a fantastic time of year. Did you hear the words of the songs we sang? Uh, of course, I'm not talking about Santa Claus and Jingle Bells and all that garbage. But are you kidding? Did you, you hear the words of Silent Night? Uh, radiant beams from thy holy face with the power of redeeming. Are you kidding me? <laughs> what about that don't people like? I'll never understand. It's awesome to think that God became a man and came into the world. It's awesome to celebrate that. And those nativity stories ought to be preached year-round because they're so powerful. I mean, if you ever stop and think about it, that that is the entrance of God into the world? And God, in what form? A baby? They bind him and bind him and bind him and bind him in swaddling clothes. Where? In a cave? And then at the end of his life, they pry him off a tree. And another, Joseph and Mary, drag him into another cave. And what do they do? They bind him and 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 bind him. And bind him. And what is the meaning of this inclusio? Of a binding at the beginning and a binding at the end of his earthly life. But this, for 33 years, the infinite and eternal God allowed himself to be limited by man. He put himself in bondage to save us with the dawn of redeeming grace Christ the Savior is born glory to the newborn king do we not look for him to come again <laughs> Jesus is coming but I'm afraid he comes at night just like he came the first time and I'm afraid too many people that I don't know are oblivious to it who's going to know some odd shepherds here, a few flocks, a few wise men from unexpected places studying scripture, an old man that lived in the temple and they thought he was a lunatic, and an old woman who was widowed for 80 years and they thought she was crazy. Who else? As it says in the book of Malachi, who will abide the day of his coming? Who will stand when he appears? Jesus is coming to purify the world in righteousness. Do you believe that? Yeah. Well, let me get back to the hymn. He says, uh, he is in the form of God. I mean, look, you know, and I'll just give you the reference, but John 1 says he was, he was with God in the beginning. He had a preexistence. John 8, 23, Jesus tells him, I'm from above. You're from beneath. What a powerful thing to say, right? John 17, 5, he prays, Oh God, take me back to the glory that I had with you before I came with the Father. And then one, perhaps one of the most cryptic and powerful statements Jesus ever made about himself in Matthew 11. Nobody, nobody knows the Father but the Son. And nobody can know the Son, really. But the Father, and whoever he chooses to reveal him to. I mean, if you ever think about it, I mean, look, if you talk about a claim to deity right there, Jesus is infinite. We know Jesus. How much do we know? Just a little bit. Because we do not even have the capacity to know him in fullness. Now, you can know everything about me if you hang around long enough. And I commend you for staying, okay? But the thing is, not him. In infinity, we'll be seeing stuff about him that will go. He's not, there's no one else like him. He was in the form of God. And... It says, he did not regard equality of God a thing to hold on to. Verse 6. That's what it literally says. Did not regard... He was in the form of God. It doesn't literally say, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He said, 
is not something he grasped is equality with God. In fact, the word is interesting, and I'm not a big word study person, but I, I do believe that some of these words are so powerful. And this one grasped is harpagmos, harpagmos. Now, what other word do we know in the Greek that is similar to this is harpazo, right? And that is a word that refers to the rapture because it means you're going to get snatched, right? So this is the same root, and basically what he's saying is he didn't clutch on to his equality with God. And the Greeks had a, sta- a saying. See, this is a hard word for, for many years for people to translate, but through all kinds of study in the Greek, other Greek texts and secular texts and everything like that, they came to realize that the Greeks had a saying to count something as a harpagmos, which means... Something that you already have that you can use for your own exam- for your own advantage. Something almost like our expression, a trump card or an ace up the sleeve. Okay, to, to Jesus, Jesus isn't like the rest of us. He's God. Okay, he's not trying to be God. Or he's not trying not to be God. He's not going to achieve Godhood. He's the eternal God. But that status is not something that he saw as something to exploit, to get out of trouble, to avoid pain, to keep himself exempt from suffering. Uh, it's rather something that he saw that he could use for us and use in this sense. Uh, Someone quoted it earlier. I can't remember who, but Psalm 40. It says, uh, well, go there. Hold your finger in Philippians. Go to Psalm 40. We can look at a few scriptures today, can't we? All right, two people said yes, so I'll take that. That's 100%. Psalm 40. And I love this one, too. Uh, this, this is one of those mystical psalms. It's cosmic. It's conversation between father and son in eternity past. Before the incarnation, we're, we're allowed to overhear a conversation. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined and heard my cry. So first you got a, 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 a righteous sufferer. But let me, let me move on down to verse 6. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you've opened. Burnt offering and sin offering have you not required? Well, the answer to the question, what does God want? And he says, you don't really want sacrifice or sin offerings. God doesn't really want that. God wants a one person, one person who will fulfill everything from love for him. That's what he wants. The rest are provisional. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, the law, thy law is within my heart. I know what you want. I'm coming. You prepared a body for me. I know what you require. Me. I know what you require. He didn't see equality with God as a trump card to get out of trouble. He saw it. Go back to, uh, to Philippians. He saw it as a qualification. I'm uniquely qualified to solve this problem because I am God. <laughs> Complete opposite. See, Paul got it. 
Paul really got it. How do we know? He didn't see Roman citizenship as a trump card to pull out and get out of trouble. He kept that card hidden and went through it so his brother wouldn't have to be alone. And that's the love of Jesus. That's the power of Jesus. Okay. And where did Paul get that from? Jesus. Now I'm going to tell you something about Christian transformation. How do we change? You change by beholding Jesus, by getting to know him. We behold him from glory to glory and faith to faith. And basically, that's what's supposed to change us. Not some discipline program. Not some uh, New Year's re- resolution. It's Jesus that can, only Jesus can change us. See, I changed in this way, and so did almost every Christian, whether they realize it or not. If you're a real Christian, you change in this way. Okay. The Bible says this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Faith overcomes the world. Well, what do you mean by that? What's that verse mean? Well, basically this. What is the world? Well, the world's a value system. It's deep. It's ingrained. And what is the value system? Always put self first. Be true to yourself, as every Walt Disney cartoon teaches. From uh, Follow your heart. And basically, really, if you bring it out in its naked deformity, the value system is the lie of the garden. You shall be as God's. And this is what we live, whether we know it or not. Because it's not like you had to be taught that at your mother's lap. It's actually in your mother's milk. Worldliness is pervasive. Now, what, how do we overcome the world? Along comes the gospel. And hits us with power, if it hits us at all. With this truth. Hey, you got an opposite. Man can never become a God. But God became a man. Now when that hits you, you overcome the world. I don't want to subscribe to Self magazine. Self has been my undoing. Okay. Now Paul got it. Now go back to Philippians chapter 2. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, regarded equality God with God not something to be held on to. He did not, uh, he did not count, a, count equality with God as a harpagmo, as the Greeks would say. A trump card, an ace up the sleeve. In fact, his whole approach to how he saw himself and who he is is complete opposite. Equality with God is my unique qualifications to come enter into a body and die on a cross for mankind. Wow. Now I pray to God that he could show us this by revelation because I'm afraid my words are too bankrupt to truly do justice to it. But it's the big, big truth of Christianity. The incarnation is the big core of our faith. Well, let me go on. He made himself of no reputation. What it literally says is he emptied himself. Now, I want to say something. He could never, ever, ever, ever stop being God. God cannot divest himself of Godhood. But there's a sense in which, in the son's case, he put it in suspense. This is the meaning of the beautiful Christmas story. Men for centuries look up to God, and rightly so. In this case, Mary is looking down into the face of God. (laughs) That is a mystery. He says, let me try and... Take us to the end. He took on him the form of a servant 
And I always think of when he washed their feet, how he stripped himself down, put on servant's clothes. You know, that whole thing, that whole scenario is so powerful because he's at the head of the table at a feast. So he's the Lord of the feast is really, really what they call it. Whoever hosts the feast is the Lord of the feast. He's the Lord of the feast and they're all st- seated in their places and there's probably little arguments about who gets to sit in what place because place is everything, right? And he gets up from the table in John 13 and strips himself of his feastal clothes. And people start getting awkward, man. What's going on here? And he gets down. He goes down to their level of their feet. These are orientals, the foot. You don't touch a foot. A foot is an insult. Remember they threw a shoe at George Bush. I was amazed at how agile he was. He just kind of dodged it. And then he actually literally pulled out a basin and poured the water out and began with his hands to wash their feet. What? 